So the topic has been already introduced by Professor Pravas Chakravarti and earlier by Dr. Sikumar Banerjee, with whom I have interacted earlier. And I was, as mentioned, that I was in DA model earlier. And this activity actually started during my stay in DA model. And there we I worked on binary morbidinum silly site. And because it's still relevant, I'm still continuing this research. Uh, being in an academic institution, it is slightly difficult to do, but uh, with some collaboration, I'm able to manage. So I will today's talk. I will I will give you a brief introduction, and then I will talk about the phase equilibria in monoplasm and niobium silicides, and about the structure mechanical property relationships, where I will be emphasizing on mechanical properties, and then also because these are for high temperature applications, I cannot skip oxidation behavior. So I will talk a little about oxidation behavior, and then summarize. So this. Uh, this view graph shows the variation operating temperature uh, with strength, uh, strength by density, that is a specific strength of different types of materials. So we have the conventional materials, titanium and super titanium alloys and super alloys towards the bottom goes up to around 1095 or about 1100 degrees centigrade, nickel based super alloys. And there are certain classes of metamatrix composites which actually go to higher temperature, but then the intermetallics. You can go up to 1500 degrees centigrade and ceramics, carbon carbon composites, they can go up to a range of 2000 degrees centigrade. And series sites are somewhere here uh, around 1500 degrees centigrade uh, and with much high strength to density ratio. And that's why they are of interest to us. For quite some time, molybdenum disilicide since 1950s is used as supercanthal heating element in furnaces going up to 1700 degrees centigrade. But then a realization happened that this could be used as a structural material for applications beyond super alloys. So some activity started in that process and gradually it gave up to the use of multi-component alloys and not only multi-component silicon based alloys, but also niobium silicon based alloys. So we have this, uh, in this view graph we show, uh, I show the temperature of base metal in gas turbine. And we the higher generation nickel based super alloys can withstand uh, quite a bit of high temperature going up to uh, 1100 degrees centigrade. You can see single crystal third generation alloys. But we, for improving the efficiency of jet engines, uh, it is necessary to go to even higher temperatures so that the cooling is not required. So there is an effort to develop refractory based uh, intermetallic alloys of niobium silicon and molybdenum silicon. And uh, the strategies are use of refractory metals, intermetallics with higher melting points. And uh, design and development, uh, so design multi-phase microstructures with deformable and undeformable constituents. Uh, so they, it is supposed to be a mix, mix of those with some optimum volume fractions. And also do solid solution strengthening of the matrix phase, which is usually a refractory metal and have optimum sizes for matrix grains, dispersed phases, and reinforcements. And also try to form a, uh, aim at forming a passive oxide scale to protect against oxidation at high temperature. So we'll see how this is achieved in uh, silicides. So this is a binary diagram of molybdenum silicon, uh, and we can see the position of MOSI2. So it has got the maximum silicon content, and that is why it is able to form a passive layer of SiO2 at high temperature, which is stable up to 1700 degree, 1800 degree centigrade. And that is why it is popularly used in the super canthal heating element. But it doesn't have, uh, its strength falls beyond 1200 degree centigrade. Uh, and its fracture toughness is very poor, as we'll see. But other intermetallics are MO5 SI3 and MO3 SI. Uh, which are also MO5 SI has certain solubility range, MO3 SI and MO SI2 are line compounds. And uh, they have very high melting points. But then the main problem is their brittleness. Uh, we'll see that. And in an iobium silicon, this is an iobium silicon phase diagram. Here we have uh, almost like a line compound, an iobium NB5 SI3 with a little bit of solubility range. So we have alpha NB5 SI3 at uh, lower temperatures and beta NB5 NB5 SI3 at higher temperatures. And it has got a eutectic at uh, around 17.5% uh, silicon and around 19 15 degrees centigrade, where actually it forms NBSS and NB3SI. And then NB3SI undergoes eutectoid transformation to form NBSS and NB5 SI3. And often, because of the rapid cooling, NB3SI remains in the microstructure. So that, and 
it is something which is undesirable. Uh, so I will now talk about the structure mechanical property relationships. And this is, you can see the crystal structures of MOSI2, MO3SI, MO5SI, B2. They are uh, complex with large number of atoms in a given unit cell. So MOSI2 has eight, units, eight atoms in unit cell. It has got body center tetragonal structure. MO3SI also has got eight uh, atoms. It has a cubic structure. But uh, and uh, all these structures are low symmetry. MO5SIB2 has a tetragonal structure with 32 atoms. Melting points are, up, are all above 2000 degrees centigrade, but fracture toughness is in the range of 1 to 3, 4 MPA root meter, which is unacceptable for structural applications. The brittle to ductile transition temperatures are also quite high, but uh, because the temperature range of use is high, so that is not that much of a problem. But the room temperature fracture toughness is a major problem. And why these are brittle? So I'm just, just giving one example of MOSI2. You can see that it has got four independent slip systems up to 1300 degrees centigrade. And one of these slip systems, which is active at around uh, 1300 degrees centigrade and higher temperatures, is shown here. So beyond some height, at only high temperature, five independent systems are there. So polycrystalline MOSI2 is brittle at ambient temperatures. Although single crystals may be uh, good for use, they may have some amount of ductility, but the problem is that again, low fracture toughness. So the fracture toughness data and fracture strength data is shown here. You can see that uh, with addition of reinforcement like silicon carbide alumina, the maximum fracture toughness obtained is around five to six MP root meter, which is still not sufficient. And the mechanism of toughening you see in ceramic matrix composites or brittle matrix composites is shown in, you get in MOSI2 as well. You can see crack deflection, uh, crack branching and intergranular cracking. So this is an indentation crack and we could see this happening. So, uh, so the problems of MOSI2 are summarized that it has got less number of slip systems than required. So the required number of slip systems is five uh, for getting ductility in a polycrystalline material. And the brittle to ductile transition temperature is also high, low fracture toughness and poor creep resistance at high temperatures. So there is some, uh, uh, something done with uh, by addition of reinforcements, uh, brittle and ductile, some improvement in fracture toughness has been obtained, but only advantage is that oxidation resistance is very impressive and that is why it is used in heating element. And other oxidation, uh, the oxidation resistance of other silicides as such is insufficient. And this is this, this view graph shows the key properties of different intermetallics. And these tests were done, some of the tests were done in air and some in vacuum. So now this MOSI2 has different, in different orientations, those different kinds of properties. For example, 001 orientation is a hard orientation. So its creep resistance is better compared to that in 051 orientation. And that's what is observed here. MO5 SIB2 has very high creep resistance as shown here. So this is, this was done at 1500 degrees centigrade and it still shows lower creep rate compared to MOSI to 1300 degrees centigrade. These are the compression creep properties of uh, MOSI to best materials. We can see that with improve adding action of aluminum or uh, silicon carbide is improvement uh, in creep resistance. And in single crystals, the creep resistance is obviously better than in polycrystalline MOSI to. And uh, so this is a summary of the creep properties. So these materials are suitable for high temperature applications, but not suitable for uh, structural applications because of room temperature fracture toughness. So the way to go is to go to a multi, use multi-component alloys, at least standard alloys, or molybdenum silicon boron alloys, where we have three phases, molybdenum solid solution, MO3SI, and MO5SI-B2. For molybdenum solid solution uh, contributes to toughness. MO5SI-B2 contributes to creep resistance. And with MO3SI, MO5SI-B2 also contributes to formation of protective borosilicate scale, which provides oxidation resistance. And this is a ternary phase diagram of molybdenum, partial ternary phase diagram of molybdenum boron silicon. And the range of compositions which are used are basically in the phase field where we get MO, MO3SI and MO5SI-B2, which is also known as a T2 phase. And this is a typical microstructure that we get in these kind of ternary alloys. And the advantage is that these cracks are arrested by the molybdenum solution particles uh, or phases, uh, which is available and the cracks get blunted or crack bridging is done because this phase is ductile. And 
in the load displacement curve, uh, which is done for the fracture toughness test, we could see that there's a non-linearity and the, the, the load uh, drop got arrested because of the crack getting arrested by the uh, molybdenum ductile molybdenum particle uh, phase grain, and then uh, it undergoes work hardening. So there is some increase in the load after the initial load drop, and then there is a stable regime where load doesn't decrease much with displacement. So this is a regime where deformation takes place in the molybdenum. So, there, so this is something which is observed uh, in, in materials which are reinforced with ductile, uh, the brittle materials having ductile reinforcements. And, uh, but still we can see that uh, we have this, uh, I've given the mechanical properties at room temperature of the molybdenum disilicide, ammonium SIC, Modern silicon boron alloys, uh, MMSI we alloy with reinforced with uh, alloy with three atom percent aluminium, and uh, also uh, niobium silicide alloys, uh, niobium silicon molybdenum alloys. Uh, one is hypoeutectic, one is hyperutectic. Uh, you can see that in the niobium silicides, the fracture toughness range is slightly higher compared to that of what you get in MOSI2 or MOSI B alloys. Of course, the MOSI B alloy shows higher fracture toughness compared to MOSI2. So uh, the, I, the, it was found that if you have a, a higher volume fraction of molybdenum phase and if, they, if it is a continuity in the molybdenum, ductile molybdenum phase, then the fracture toughness can be improved significantly up to 15 MP root meter. But that happens at the expense of oxidation resistance because oxidation resistance of pure molybdenum is very not uh, good at high temperature because refra all refractory metals like molybdenum, niobium, they are, uh, oxidation resistance is uh, not uh, not very good. So that is why the addition of silicon is important. So there is a trade-off. You cannot increase the molybdenum content uh, too much uh, beyond some limit. Uh, then the high temperature capability goes down, then you need a, probably some kind of a coating, which is another approach being used these days. So this is the trend shown for high, the high temperature ill stress with increase in temperature. So you can see that uh, one of these plots is for niobium silicon molybdenum alloys, which is here. And the molybdenum silicon alloys are shown here, molybdenum silicon boron alloy is shown here. So it is showing superior oxidation resistance compared to MOSI2 or MOSI2 SIC composite. So the ternary alloys definitely are uh, now that is why they have got um, they have drawn more interest because of possibility of better fracture toughness and higher strength retention at high temperature. And also there is a borosilicate scale forming we'll see which provides oxidation resistance. But to, with, because of the promise of higher uh, room temperature fracture toughness, we also have worked on niobium silicon molybdenum alloys. So I'll get into that now. So the Forerunner in the activity on niobium silicon based alloys was GE, uh, GE aircraft engines in US, and they uh, did a lot of work in that, and they worked on multi component alloys where niobium is solid solution hardened by titanium and hafnium, and uh, silicon and silicon and uh, chromium as alloys are uh, as alloy elements. So, what they get is a BCC solid solution of niobium, niobium is BCC solid solution. A 5-3 silicide NB5SI3, as expected from the phase diagram, and Laves phase, which is actually having chromium and niobium in it. And the high temperature strength retention is observed like this. But again, the oxidation resistance is poor. And another problem is that they have the undesirable NB3SI phase, which actually is bad for room temperature fracture toughness. And um, certain other mechanical properties, also oxidation resistance is poor for NB3SI. And uh, so so this is something which is undesirable and they have not done any addition of molybdenum here. So at IIT Kharagpur, we tried addition of molybdenum. So we first tried with ternary niobium silicon molybdenum alloys with uh, one of my, our earlier students who is uh, now a faculty member at VHU. His name is Ko. So, uh, so we tried, uh, so we tried addition of molybdenum. So we found that it inhibits the formation of NB3SI. It stabilizes beta 5 3 silicide and uh, it also forms isomorphic solid solution in niobium. So that is an advantage and it leads to sufficient strengthening and also the melting point of niobium increases with solid solution 
uh, of, because of the presence of molybdenum in solid solution. And also it reduces the diffusivity because of higher melting point. And as a result, it improves the high temperature strength. So uh, this is the microstructure that we got in the hypotectic where we have now this, this, this solid solution as the primary phase and eutectic with NVSS and NV5SI3. In MO is present in solid solution in NV and also in NV5SI3. It occupies an IBM site. And this is a hyper eutectic alloy where we have uh, basically the NV5SI3 as the primary phase and the eutectic over here. And we found that uh, because of the crack bridging by the ductile niobium solid solution, which is a coarse eutect, uh, and we also found formation of non laminar eutectic in this kind of in this system, which actually uh, led to toughening. The niobium uh, part of the eutectic uh, course is coarse, and it is able to arrest or bridge the cracks, whereas in the laminar eutectic, the cracks could pass through without any toughening. So what is desirable is non-laminar eutectic and uh, uh, so, somewhat coarse niobium solid solution phase. And for in the when we did high temperature compression test, also room temperature compression test, we found that the, at room temperature the hyper eutectic alloys showed uh, higher strength because of the primary because NV5 SI3 being the primary phase, it is harder than niobium solid solution. Whereas niobium solid solution being the primary phase and it is softer in less hardness compared to NV5 SI3 shows lower strength. And again, the strength increase in molybdenum uh, content because molybdenum leads to solid solution strengthening of niobium. At high temperature, what we found is that uh, hypotectic material uh, actually showed equivalent or higher maximum stress compared to uh, the hyper eutectic. So that shows the effect of solid solution strengthening. Even the yield strengths are comparable, maximum stress is actually comparable. So there is work hardening of niobium solid solution phase and that is leading to uh, higher strength retention. And also we found that there is NBMO5 SI3 or NB3 SI uh, particles uh, forming inside the, the primary NBSS, which actually leads to some kind of dislocation particle interaction we'll see in another slide. And uh, strength retention, we have, we, have pro, pro, we have normalized the maximum stress observed for the niobium silica at high temperature by the maximum stress observed at room temperature to uh, quantify the strength retention at high temperature. And we find that this ratio is higher for the high eutectic alloy. And obviously the strength retention decreases with increasing temperature and becomes almost equal at 1200 degrees centigrade. But uh, interestingly, the hypotectic color shows better strength retentivity and hypotectic color shows lower strength retentivity. This, this is believed to be uh, probably due to the cracking in V5SI3 of which we have got some evidence. And also because of solution hardening of niobium solid solution. And uh, plastic strain at maximum stress is also higher for the hypotectic uh, compositions as expected because of the ductile phase being the primary phase. And uh, we are here we see evidence of dislocation particle interaction. As I mentioned, there is some NBM of 3SI precipitates inside the NBSS solid solution, which we have found evidence. And uh, they actually uh, interact with the dislocations, uh, impede dislocation motion, and they contribute. So there is not only solid solution hardening, there is also particle strengthening inside the Niobium solid solution, which contributes to their high temperature strength retention. Then we looked at, uh, so very recently we have done some work with one of my present students where we, uh, she has the, added, added 20 atom percent titanium to NVSI molybdenum alloys with whatever was uh, left by my earlier students. And we have also done annealing at 1500 degrees centigrade for 60 to 60 hours and 100 hours and looked at the effect on changes on microstructure, fracture toughness, high temperature, strain retention and oxidation. So I'll uh, just give some results. So these are the microstructures that we see in the ASCAST condition. You can see that in the ternary alloys, we have a significant amount of laminar eutectic. And here, this is hypotectic alloy, so niobium solid solution is the primary phase. The eutectic comprises of NBSS and the 5,3 silicide. We have written 5,3 silicide because the niobium contains molybdenum and titanium in solid solution. 
and uh, so and this is basically the hyperutectic alloy you see the triphosylicide as the primary phase and on addition of titanium we see the nbss becomes much coarser and the amount of non laminar eutectic decreases very sharply in both hyperutectic and hyperutectic compositions and also we see some amount of beta titanium solid solution forming which is around 5 volume fraction so uh, and on annealing uh, of course uh, there is coarsening of the primary phase nbss both in the eutectic as well as in the uh, solid uh, as in the, as well as in the primary phase and there is some kind of interconnect connection happening in the nbss and uh, so we also we have done annealing for both 1500 at 1500 degrees centigrade for 100 hours for both primary uh, for both hyperutectic and hyperutectic alloys and uh, we can see the changes in microstructure on annealing the laminar eutectic completely converted to non laminar eutectic and there is coarsening and solidization of nbss uh, that we observed and this tm image shows the presence of beta titanium solid solution uh, at uh, at intergranular locations of nbss and fibrocelli site in both hyperutectic and hyperutectic alloys so it actually happens because of titanium rejection uh, during solidification from nbss and fibrocelli site excess titanium uh, and it solidifies last to form beta tiss at the grain boundaries and it is also able to absorb the crack that we'll see later later and these are the stem images of uh, showing x ray images of uh, done by stem ads and shows the confirms that uh, co composition of titanium so solid solution now uh, and five tcl site and uh, we also found the formation of nb titanium 3si precipitates inside nbss and confirmed that by uh, diffraction and these are the volume fractions uh, so of the primary phase and uh, and laminar eutectic as i mentioned laminar eutectic was significantly available in the asca structure of, of ternary alloys but with addition of uh, titanium the laminar eutectic decreased significantly and in uh, after annealing it completely vanished so ht is annealed sample so you can see that there is certain changes in the volume fraction also with annealing for example the primary nbss has increased on annealing uh, whereas in the case of titanium it has actually decreased but the net nbss content is somewhat similar in showing that there is an increase in the eutectic so on annealing the objective of annealing was to reach an equilibrium structure because arc melting in, in, involves fast cooling so annealing was done at a very high temperature 1500 degrees centigrade uh, for up to 100 hours duration basically to obtain argon environment to obtain equilibrium structure we also did some annealing at 60 hours and compared the microstructures so here i'll be talking mainly about 100 hours uh, properties only so we can see that there is a significant improvement in the fracture toughness on annealing and this is because of the coarsening of the nylon solid solution which is actually is responsible for blunting or arresting of the cracks and on titanium addition there is actually significant gain both in ascus condition with respect to the ascus ternary alloy and also on heat treating on annealing we got uh, as much as 14 mpa root meter 15 mpa root meter uh, fracture toughness by doing uh, testing uh, by uh, using ASTM E399 E399 specifications. We also did indentation fracture toughness, and for that we actually got 30% higher fracture toughness value, which I'm not reporting. But uh, from regular fracture toughness test, we got around 14 MPa root meter maximum. In the of course the fracture toughness was lo lower for the hyperutectic alloys, but still we got up to around uh, 12 MPa root meter on an in the annealed alloy, and the lower fracture toughness is expected because Hyperutectic is the primary phase, but because of the contribution of the NBSS in the eutectic to crack blunting, uh, we got uh, still quite high fracture toughness. So this shows that titanium is helpful for improving the fracture toughness. And these are the indentation crack paths. We can see there is evidence of crack blunt arrest and blunting in annealed sample, which is less in the ASCAS samples. And then blunting is done mainly by the nylon solid solution phase. And we also saw in the hyperutectic uh, alloy, we also found evidence of crack deflection at interface boundaries. And of course, uh, crack bridging is there by the nylon solid solution phase. And, of, and in the quaternary alloys, there is a greater amount of deflection and bridging. 
compared to that internal alloys, which has led to higher structure toughness of the quaternary alloys. As you can see in the previous slides, you can see the quaternary alloys actually have shown higher fracture toughness compared to the ternary alloys. So there is an advantage of addition of titanium. So this is proven. And uh, we also measure elastic modulus by ultra, uh, ultra phase ultrasound spectroscopy, and uh, which is actually which involves measurement of phase shift at different frequencies and also measurement of velocities of the longitudinal shear waves to measure the calculate the elastic modulus and Poisson's ratio. We found that uh, by comparing that on annealing, both in ternary and quaternary alloys, we have the fracture, the elastic modulus has increased. The Poisson's ratio has become more metal-like compared to, for, for example, ceramics have a Poisson's ratio of 0.2 and metals have a Poisson's ratio of 0.33. So the Poisson's ratio approaches that of metals. And for, for a perfectly polished plastic material, it should be 0.5, which you don't get normally. And uh, so you see that on addition of titanium, there is an increase in the elastic modulus, and all these things are related to the changes in the volume fraction of different phases. Also, in annealing, we undergo the the beta NB5 SIT, whatever is left out of the uh, in the ASCA structure, we have both beta and alpha 5 to silicide, and the beta to alpha transformation is very slow. So during rapid cooling, it doesn't take place much, but during annealing, it does take place. And alpha 5 to silicide is a higher elastic modulus compared to beta 5 to silicide. And that is why the modulus mainly increases. And also there is partitioning of molybdenum to NVSS from 5 3 silicide. And because molybdenum has a higher melting point, elastic modulus is also higher than niobium. So it's partitioning to niobium solid solution actually. Uh, and that's a significant amount of partitioning has been observed that contributes to increase in the elastic modulus. And because of the uh, metallicity of the material, uh, the, the Poisson's ratio has increased on annealing. Same behavior, so this is for hyperutectic alloy, and so similar behavior is also observed for the hyperutectic alloy. The mechanisms are same, so I need not repeat it. And obviously, here also there is also an effect of change of eutectic morphology from lamellar to non lamellar, which also contributes to increasing in the Poisson's ratio. And this contributes in both the cases because if the eutectic becomes non lamellar, then the deformation uh, requires less constraint and uh, because there is more constraint when the eutectic is lamellar. So if the deformation requires less constraint, the Poisson's ratio is supposed to increase. And so uh, this is the, this, so these are the results of compressive yield strength at room temperature and, uh, and compressive strength and plastic uh, and compressive ductility. We could get out to six to 7% compressive ductility. And we see that uh, on annealing, it has increased, and as expected, on annealing, the room temperature compressive strength decreases, and we got very high compressive strength, and it increases on addition of titanium. So both fracture toughness and strength increases on addition of uh, titanium. It goes up to 2100 MPa root meter uh, from around uh, uh, 1500, or the lowest, which is observed in the annealed ternary alloy. So this is significant. and then we look at the strength, high temperature strength retention and uh, high temperature yield strength. So we can see that as expected, the compressive yield strength decreases with increasing temperature. But uh, at 900 degrees centigrade, the ternary quarter hyper, hyper eutectic alloy shows higher strength. But as we increase the temperature, the titanium containing alloy, uh, but hyper eutectic composition shows higher strength. And uh, if you compare the behavior at 1100 degrees centigrade, we see that in annealed condition, the hyperutectic alloy shows considerably higher strength compared to the hyperutectic alloys. So this was very interesting. And of course, there is decrease in strength on annealing, but the decrease is less for the annealed alloys. And if you look at the strength retention, again, the and compare the hyperutectic and hyperutectic here, the hyperutectic alloy shows uh, slightly higher strength retention at high temperature, at all temperatures. And at 900 degrees centigrade for hyperutectic composition, greater strength retention is absorbed in titanium addition, which is uh, this one. You can see that this is a, uh, uh, sorry, this is actually other way also. And ASCAS alloys have exhibited greater strength retention than those in annealed alloys. So this is also another thing that we observe. We have plotted sigma 
the yield strength at high temperature and by yield strength at room temperature to quantify the strength retention. And if you look at the microstructures after deformation, what we see there is cracking in the hyperutectic alloys, ternary alloys, and there is less cracking on addition of titanium. And in annealed alloy, crack is even less. So there is more chances of deformation taking place in the annealed hyper, uh, hyper, uh, hyperutectic alloys. And that is why uh, there is uh, effect of solution solution strengthening and there is better strength retention. We also saw, saw some evidence of decohesion and debonding at interfaces. So next I go to oxidation behavior. So this is the oxidation behavior of niobium silicon molybdenum alloys. And you can see that uh, th these are the non-isothermal plots uh, for hyperutectic and hyperutectic alloys. And uh, we have seen that after some time, uh, so the, we, around 700, 800, close to 800 degrees centigrade, the oxidation begins in these hyperutectic alloys. And these are for the hyperutectic alloys. And what we see that with addition, increase in molybdenum content over here, see here you see multiple alloys being compared. And we can see that the alloy with uh, higher molybdenum content low, shows less weight gain compared to alloy with lower molybdenum content. So actually molybdenum is helping in improving the oxidation resistance. And these are uh, plots for isothermal oxidation at 1,000 uh, degrees centigrade for 24, hour, 24 hours. And here also you see that the alloy with uh, alloys with higher molybdenum content, 15 mo on 26 mo, they show low, much lower mass gain compared to that observed in the al alloys with lower molybdenum content. So molybdenum increase in molybdenum content has actually helped in improving the oxidation resistance because molybdenum addition actually lowers the activity of niobium, and NbTO5 is the oxidation product. So so probably uh, what we found that uh, molybdenum addition actually improves the centrability of the scale and uh, it assists in the formation of SiO2 because lower the activity of niobium, it actually promotes the formation of an SiO2 layer at the interface between the oxide scale and the alloy, which is protective in nature. So this was observed on oxidation at 1100 degrees centigrade, not 1150. So this slows down the this acts as a diffusion barrier for oxygen. So we have also done similar work, uh, non-isothermal work, uh, oxidation work on titanium containing alloys, and we found that on addition of titanium, uh, the mass gain is actually decreases. So you can see that titanium containing alloys have shown much lower mass gain at high temperature, and it also shows uh, slower mass gain with increasing temperature. And that is observed for both hypoeutectic and hyperutectic uh, temperatures, uh, co compositions. And this is for ASCAST alloy, this is for annealed alloys. In, in annealed condition, you can see that uh, the same kind of trend is observed. So that means 20 atom percent titanium addition is beneficial. And these are the uh, isothermal oxidation behaviors at 1200 degrees centigrade uh, for different uh, compositions. And this one is for the hyperutectic alloy at different temperatures. So as expected with increasing temperature, the oxygen resistance has become worse. Uh, but at 1200 degrees centigrade, you can actually show lower mass gain compared to that at 1100 degrees centigrade. Uh, uh, sorry, at, uh, compared to that at 900 degrees centigrade. So this is interesting. You saw, see more mass gain at 900 doing isothermal oxidation compared to uh, that at 1100 and 1200. So this is again due to the formation of a stable oxide scale at higher temperature because the silica uh, oxide scale formation needs slightly high temperature because of the slower growth rate of silicon at silicon dioxide at higher temp lower temperatures compared to niobium oxide uh, because its parabolic rate constant is low. So SiO2 has a slow growth rate and it forms a stable scale only at uh, temperatures like 1100, 1200 degrees centigrade and that is why the oxidation resistance improves with increase in temperature here. And uh, because of that, when titanium is present, we also get uh, mixed oxides like Nb2TiO7 and TiO2, besides Nb2O5. And SiO2 is basically is amorphous, so its peaks are not observed. And as I mentioned, that we get a uh, oxide scale um, which is uh, more stable and more passive 
for titanium containing alloys which is observed here and this is very rough you can see for tannate alloys the scale is rough and i have not shown the pictures of 1100 degrees centigrade it is actually more having shown showing more roughness so as we increase the temperature of oxidation the oxide scale becomes uh, more smooth and uh, there is a step and also we found that uh, with addition of titanium the oxide scale scaleness also decreases significantly yeah i am close i am about uh, close to finish so there is a significant decrease in the oxide cell thickness so this again proves that from this cross sectional images that titanium addition has helped in improving the oxidation resistance and these are some results from molybdenum silicon boron alloys uh, where we did isothermal oxidation cyclic oxidation and we found that at 1150 degrees centigrade the MOSI B alloy shows the best oxidation resistance and here we find mass loss because of the vaporization of molybdenum trioxide which is a, um, having very high vapor pressure so around 700-800 degrees centigrade, uh, it undergoes is uh, vaporization temperature is there. So it actually vaporizes very quickly, but at higher temperature like 1300 degrees centigrade, again uh, the mass loss is large because there is significant amount of vaporization. But at 1150 degrees centigrade, or, uh, around uh, 900 degrees centigrade, we find that the borosilicate scale is able to form and protect from oxidation. And if you can form the um, protective scale at 11 by prior exposure to 1150 degrees centigrade. Then, even if you do cyclic oxidation from 1150 to 700, 800 or room temperature, that means you cool to that temperature, bring up to 1150 degrees centigrade. The amount of mass gain is significantly, mass loss is significantly less. So, and that uh, proof is found here that we find a protective scale of borosilicate, uh, which is preventing from further oxidation. So, this is observed in the case of molybdenum silicon boron alloys. We also did uh, some uh, study where we looked at the transient oxidation behavior. We saw the mass loss with increasing uh, time of exposure at 1150. And we found that after some time, the mass loss stabilized. Initially, there was mass loss, but after about 480 seconds, there was no more mass loss. So this is about eight minutes. So it about takes about eight minutes to form a stable scale. So this is something which we actually took out the samples, and this was done by one MTech student, Born Roy. And we, f we found that the, uh, there is initially cavities forming. In, uh, so this is because of the formation of molybdenum trioxide in its vaporization. But then the borosilicate scale forms and covers up the cavities and that happens after about eight minutes. So we took uh, pictures at different time intervals and these are those. And we also saw evidence of the uh, some kind of a fluidity of borosilicate scale because part of it is liquid is in semi-solid state. So it actually is able to flow. There's a viscosity, viscoplastic flow and it covers up the porosities created by the vaporization of molybdenum trioxide and that's how it is protective. And we also did some work with uh, refining the grain size by spark loss of sintering. And uh, so we got finer grain size here by, compared to arc melted alloys. And we found a significant improvement in oxidation resistance and we also added, did some addition of zirconium, around two atom percent zirconium to both arc melted and soil, uh, spark plus sintered alloys. And we found that addition, both addition of zirconium and uh, refinement of grain, uh, grain size decreases the oxidation uh, rate because uh, you get uh, faster formation of borosilicate scale. And zirconium addition was done at expense of molybdenum. So by reducing the amount of molybdenum uh, also, zirconium had helped. And because of zirconium was added, it also formed uh, zirconium molybdenum, uh, zr mo 4 hole 2 which, uh, so zirconium actually consumed mo 3 and formed zr mo 4 hole 2 which is not volatile. And this was confirmed by excess diffraction. And because of its formation, the vaporization of molybdenum trioxide was significantly adjusted, and it was the borosilicate scale could form more easily. So this was the mechanism and also the, one can also say that ZRO2 is harmful, but because we had high silicon composition, as, as certain other compositions, ZRO2 actually created difficulties for certain other people who have uh, reported that. But because we had high silicon content, ZRO2 was con consumed by silicon to form ZRSI, by SiO2 to form ZRSiO4. So the transformation toughening of ZRO2 during cooling uh, or during heating didn't happen. So, which actually leads to compressive stresses and which leads to formation of cracks. So, because of zr mo 4 hole 2 and zr so 4 formation, uh, fractured, uh, the oxide scale was stable and it was protective.
So finally, I would like to summarize. So we have seen that multi-phase molecular silicon boron alloys and nylon silicon molecular alloys with additional um, quaternary additions like titanium. And in the case of um, MOSIB aluminum and certain other elements can be added. They lead to ductile phase toughening. And there is high temperature retention. Retention we found that is more in the MOSIB alloys compared to nylon silicon based alloys, but fracture toughness is worse. And uh, compressive ductility, fracture toughness, and oxygen resistance of NVSI MO, MO alloys can be improved significantly by addition of 20 atoms in titanium. And uh, oxygen resistance can be improved by grain refinement and also by addition of zirconium in the case of MOSI B alloys. So, finally, I'd like to end with uh, what is uh, a few comments about the way ahead. So, we can consider MO and titanium as essential alloying elements for NBSI based alloys. Uh, so, which should be essential alloying elements, and then we can add and add other alloying elements for further improvement in strength and properties. In the case of MOSIB alloys and nylon silicon based alloys, also there can be used some protective coatings can be used, which has been uh, there is some significant activity in that direction by some groups in US, Professor Peripech and co workers. In the present work, we have also shown that addition of zirconium and iron to MOSIB alloys, actually, iron I have not shown. Uh, improves fracture uh, high temperature oxygen resistance, and it is also observed in moist atmosphere, which I have not shown today. Recently, there is some work in Japan by adding titanium to MOSI B alloys, and uh, they have found that the formation of TIC actually uh, lowers the peeling bedwater ratio to make it close to one and improves the oxidation resistance significantly. So, with this, uh, I like to uh, thank my uh, students, because I have shown a lot of work of, of Kasturi, who actually has worked, done the work on nylon silicon based alloys where titanium has been added to NBSI MO alloys. And uh, initially, Professor Ko Dr. Koshik Chattopadhyay was involved, uh, who is presently associate professor at ITBHQ. Following Maji also did some work in between. I have not shown her work could, in today's presentation. She is a faculty in IIT Jamshedpur. Nankishore Kumar did uh, work on MOSI B alloys, finished finish PhD recently. Uh, on oxidation and, and drier and moisture. Arvind Sivastava was my first MTech student to work on MTech MOSI B alloys after I came from DMRL, and I've shown some result of that. Borno's name already mentioned, who worked on the transient oxidation behavior, and Sharma Paswan worked on MOSI B alloys oxidation behavior, isothermal and non isothermal, which I've shown some slides. I also acknowledge my collaborators, Professor KK Rai, Professor Sanat Kumar Roy, and Professor Jayanto Das who shared student with me at some some point of time. And uh, some of the annealing work at 1500 degree centigrade and high temperature compression tests were done at IISC by Kasturi. And we also got help from DMRL for high temperature compression test. And there was some funding from DRDO at some point of time. Right now, there is no project from DRDO on this in this topic. Uh, but uh, we have, uh, not in this topic, but I have projects in other topics. So thank you very much for your kind attention.